Good morning, everyone. I'd like you, if you would, to turn with me to the book of Joel and chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 13 down to verse 20. Joel 1, verse 13, down to verse 20. And we're going to be thinking primarily about the topic of the solemn assembly. The solemn assembly. So beginning in verse 13, it said, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come. Lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat offering cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, and the garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is with withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And again, God will add a blessing to the reading of his precious word to us as we consider this portion together. So if we recall, we have seen and observed that there was a locust invasion of the land of Judah. And the result of it uh, was that uh, it had left the land barren. And so barren, that even the house of God was affected because so much of the worship of the house of God was connected with bringing meal offerings, bringing oil, uh, bringing wine as a drink offering, uh, bringing uh, cattle uh, to slaughter. And much of that had been diminished away because of the severity of this locust invasion. And so what are they to do? We've said that there was a reason behind it. Uh, the reason behind it being the fact that the nation had become complacent. Uh, they had become rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. And as a result of that, they had neglected the Lord. They were just going through the motions. And so the Lord had brought upon these circumstances upon them to get their attention, to wake them up, to bring them back to a restored, vital relationship with him. And so where does this relationship restoration begin where should it all start and so he directs his attention to the priests and so he says in verse 13 gird yourselves and lament ye priests how ye ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth ye ministers of my god for the meat offering the drink offering is withholden from the house of your god and so it, it really begins with the sanctuary the answer to the problem would begin at the sanctuary. They, the priests, the ministers of my God, by the way, isn't that amazing? A priest actually ministers to the heart of God. It's a wonderful privilege to be a priest. We think of that in a New Testament context. Uh, we can minister to the heart of God by bringing to him that which delights him, uh, that which he finds pleasure in. And of course, all these the sacrifices, as we know, were pictures of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. That is what delights him. And so these priests, these ministers of God, they were to take the lead. And how were they to do that? Well, first of all, uh, they were to don the traditional uh, garments of mourning, sackcloth. And they were to spend the whole night, it says, prostrate in the presence of God, lying down all night in sackcloth, and crying out basically to the Lord 
to turn back the barrenness that they were going through. So they were to forego normal comforts, even sleep, in order to resolve this vital matter. This matter was so urgent, it needed drastic measures. Uh, again, uh, seeking the Lord uh, for him to turn the tide of this circumstances that had left them uh, in a barren condition. Notice verse 14, that it wasn't just the priests. They were to take the lead in getting others involved in seeking the face of God to turn the tide on their behalf. And so he says in verse 14, sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. And so the, 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 the priests were not to rest content with their own lamentation, but as representatives of the people, they were to call for a day of national repentance, bringing everybody uh, together. And so they were responsible to make the first move, but also to get the people to follow. So what were they to do? Well, first of all, they were leading by example. They were the ones that had got the sackcloth. They were the ones. So they were leading by example, but not only were they leading by example, they were also to lead by exaltation. They were to, to call the people to this solemn assembly. They were to encourage them to come to the house of God and seek God to turn things back uh, in their favor. And so basically this is what they were doing. They were to unitedly cry to the Lord, owning before his face their common failure, judging their evil ways and seeking a true restoration. Now, this call for national fasting, it was not an everyday event. It was an extraordinary event. But there are several occasions in Scripture where we see such events take place. And I want to just highlight one or two of them. I'd like us to look at the book of Nehemiah. Of course, we know the, the background, the story of, of Nehemiah, that how they came uh, back from captivity. Uh, the land was pretty much laid waste as a result of the Babylonian invasion. And they're trying to rebuild the walls and reestablish the testimonies, uh, the testimony. And in the midst of this, in chapter nine, Nehemiah chapter nine, uh, we just want to read verses one through three. Uh, we'll notice now in the 20 and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. They stood up in their places and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So there would be an occasion of a solemn assembly. Now, in this case, it was because they had intermarried with pagans and they'd been confronted with this sin. Uh, the, the, the wall of separation had break, broken down, and because of this intermarriage with pagans, uh, we know historically uh, when God's people married pagan people, generally speaking, the pagans brought their hearts away from the Lord and into idolatry. Solomon would be a classic example with his thousand wives, and what happened, he turned from the Lord and ended up involved in idolatry and so this is what's happening again and and nehemiah is confronting them and saying uh, here we go again uh, you've just been restored back to the land and you're in danger of being judged again and so he calls a solemn assembly if we look at the prophecy of jeremiah and chapter 36 jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 9 again another occasion where we have this calling of a solemn assembly, Jeremiah 36, verse 9. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. And so this calling a fast. Now, usually this calling of a fast, this bringing together of God's people to do without legitimate things, to seek God in repentance and brokenness, that he might turn their barrenness into blessing. Usually it is called by the elders. Now, I want to give you an example of this in First Kings. It's not exactly the best example, but, but it does serve the purpose uh, of showing 
how this works. First Kings 21. And we'll read from verse 8, 1 Kings 21, verse 8. This is the days of uh, wicked Ahab and Jezebel. And this is about uh, the, the vineyard belonging to Naboth. But I want you to notice uh, what Jezebel does. And again, what she's doing is imitating what really should have been done uh, it, it, out of mourning genuinely uh, for the state of the nation. But it says in verse 8, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters onto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city. Okay, so we, we observe again uh, the, this elder's responsibility to call this fast. And, and of course, everybody's responsible to come and cry before the Lord because of the bleak circumstances. I'd like you to look again, please, with me at the book of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel chapter 30. Again, this, this heart cry to the Lord. That's the purpose of coming together. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 2 and 3 says, For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, and it shall be the, the time of the heathen, and the sword shall come upon Egypt. And, uh, and so uh, notice verse 2. That's the verse I'm looking for. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, how ye woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, and it shall be the time of the heathen. And so again, this idea of howling, crying to the Lord, asking him to turn the tide of events because of the, 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 the conditions that they found themselves in. So what were they to do in this, this solemn assembly? Well, first of all, they were to deny themselves food and normal work. It was a day completely set aside for the purpose of seeking God. Their gather in the temple before the Lord was to be the number one priority. They were to cry to the Lord. It's kind of a climax of this, this whole section that we've been looking at. Because of the, the barrenness of the conditions, the people were responsible to come and seek God to turn things back again. And so that was the purpose of the chastisement in the first place and the need of confession to get the people back to the Lord, back involved with the Lord in a vital relationship with him. Repentance before him and restoration to him were the answers to the problem. Again, I want to just say this, that when things go wrong, often amongst God's people today, this is really where the answer is to be found. Too often, when we're having difficulty, we look in all the wrong places for solutions. We think if we just initiate some new programs, if we have better publicity, uh, better advertising, uh, more user-friendly methods, more seeker-sensitive methods or whatever, and, and the real answer is a, it really our problems, if I could say this, are spiritual problems and our solutions are spiritual solutions. And I think we, we oftentimes we make the, the, the big mistake of looking, well, where, where is the Lord working seemingly? Where are the crowds and what are they doing? And we want to imitate them instead of basically simply getting on our faces before God and asking him to restore the blessing to us. And confessing whatever's caused us to lose the blessing. Maybe it is coldness and indifference in our hearts. Maybe we've become too formal. Maybe we've been going through the motions for too long. Maybe there's this need to call for genuine repentance and seek him. And we might somehow see blessing. Certainly what we see here is that it's not a quick fix solution. For one thing, uh, to get in the Lord's presence, uh, the priests were to lay all night. Like this is this is pretty serious business, lying in the presence of God all night in sackcloth and ashes, confessing departure and disobedient. And, and so it's not a shortcut method. Uh, this is this is uh, in a busy world where often in the busyness of life, meetings for prayer are often compromised. You know, one thing that I find shocking is increasingly in assemblies 
the least attended meeting is the prayer meeting if they even have one and sadly there are assemblies now that don't even have a prayer meeting and they wonder why they're experiencing such spiritual barrenness well if we're not crying out to the one who can solve the problem no wonder we're not seeing any blessing and so again just this idea of in the busyness of life people these people were busy too but they're taking the whole day to seek the lord in prayer and fasting uh, they canceled everything joel's message of repentance was so important they had to come and seek the lord so let's just go through just quickly as we finish this little section up what the process was joel told them how to do the work of repentance and so the first thing is consecrate a fast make getting right with god so important that even eating something perfectly legitimate is seen as not significant getting right with god is more important than anything else <laughs> right this is the most important thing secondly call a sacred assembly call for god's people to come together and repent call the people of god to to come in one place, uh, gather the elders, bring the elders together to lead in this act of repentance. Where into the house of the Lord your God? Come to the place where you normally meet to gather to seek God and then cry out to the Lord. And you, I, you want to get this sense of there's a desperation here. This is a heart cry to God. This is not just normal run-of-the-mill prayers. There's a sense of urgency of desperation here they're crying out to god and they're believing in faith that he will respond in mercy now i want you to look at one more scripture that we're very familiar with but i hadn't noticed this connection until doing this study look at second chronicles chapter seven you'll often hear this verse quoted particularly verse 14 that frequently we'll hear verse 14 quoted but I hadn't really paid attention to the surrounding context. And so I want you to look at verse 13. It said, it says, Second Chronicles 7, 13, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. And then verse 14, this is the one we know well. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, we know that verse well, the verse 14, but I had just missed the connection with verse 13 if I command the locusts to devour their land. So that's exactly what's going on here. God had commanded the locusts because of their complacency, because that they were going through the motions, because they had lost, they had left their first love. They were loving the blessings more than the blesser. They were enjoying prosperity at the hand of God and were ignoring the one who had brought the prosperity. And so God brings to them an invasion of locusts so that they might humble themselves and pray and seek his face in this solemn assembly. So now how do we apply this? Because God is not dealing with us as a national entity anymore. Uh, people often would have said in the past maybe that Canada was a Christian nation or the USA was a Christian, but that's not a biblical idea. God is gathering out of the nations now a people for his own name's sake. So the church is, is where God is working. But, but surely there's a practical application that we can draw here. And that is this. If our testimony is going through times of barrenness and leanness, is it not a fitting thing to call the saints together to pray? To, to confess if there's anything that has hindered blessing in our gathering uh, maybe complacency is set in maybe there's bitterness in the assembly because of a lack of forgiving one another maybe maybe sin has crept in i don't know but there 
I think there has to be a place, doesn't there, to seek the Lord collectively to turn the days of barrenness into days of blessing. How? By coming through this valley of brokenness where we cry out to God. We see he's the answer. He's the solution. We, we're not looking for some other uh, man-made solution. The Lord is the one that builds the house. If the Lord build, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain that build it. It's his work and we need him to work amongst us and we need to remove any hindrance to blessing. So now we come on to verse 15, having considered this, uh, this solemn assembly. And of course, we're not done with the solemn assembly because guess what? In chapter two, <laughs> we're going to be called to another solemn assembly. So this is quite a theme in the book of Joel. So we're going to revisit the solemn assembly in chapter two. But, but for now, we're going to move on and we're going to introduce another vital theme that is found in the book of Joel. And so notice what he says in verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the almighty shall it come. This is the first time in Joel's prophecy and the first time in scripture, assuming that Joel was the first of the writing prophets, this very important phrase, the day of the Lord occurs. And of course, principle of first mention, right? It's always important. What, what kind of a day is the day of the Lord? Well, it's a day of destruction from the almighty. It's a day when God directly intervenes in the affairs of men, either in destruction or in blessing, but it's God stepping in. That's the idea. That's the day of the Lord, him stepping in and doing something uh, very dramatically. So the day we're told was disastrous. An even more destructive day of the Lord was imminent. What he's saying to them is, you've just experienced this plague of locusts. This plague of locusts was so unique that it's something that you're going to tell to succeeding generations. Uh, remember, uh, tell your children about it. Let the children tell their children, their children, another generation. So it was, it was a really a, a horrendous event. But now what he's saying is, unless they come to repentance, there's worse to come. Right? Because he says, alas for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. So in other words, something worse is just around the corner than what you've just gone through in this plague of locusts, unless you come in repentance to the Lord. It's going to be a day of destruction, and it's coming from the Lord, from the Almighty, shall it come. And so this day of the Lord, God is going to step in. And unless there's genuine repentance, a time of judgment is going to be experienced by Judah that's even going to supersede the locusts that they've experienced. And so what, what a, a warning to them. Now, this, this day of the Lord, it's actually mentioned in each chapter. So it's obviously a very big theme in the book of Joel. And of course, uh, they, in one sense, the locust plague, because it, it was brought by him, was already a day of the Lord. But he's telling them that another day of the Lord is coming. Now, as we think of this general subject of the day of the Lord, there's, okay, the historical day of the Lord that's just passed this locust plague they've experienced, but there's another day of the Lord that is to come. Now, we, we know in scripture that this phrase day of the Lord is used several times, and it, it's always connected with when God steps in, in either judgment or blessing. Just keep that in, in your mind. Some of it is going to be fulfilled historically in the experience of Judah. And some of it is prophetic of a coming day. Okay. Uh, what we, we call the great and terrible day of the Lord in the end times when the, after the church is raptured, God right now, it's kind of interesting. We're living in days. It's a day of grace. 
right? So a man could could literally stand up and shake his fist at God and curse God, and nothing happens. God doesn't strike him with lightning. He doesn't turn him to to ashes. Nothing happens because it's it's a day of grace, and God's long suffering is being seen. But this day of grace is soon going to come to an end. It will come to an end at the rapture of the church, this grace period. And then we're going to move into the day of the Lord. And as we've just studied the book of Revelation, we see how God directly intervenes, right? Uh, the seals are opened in heaven, an event occurs on earth. And it's always God doing these things. He is bringing these things on the earth and this day of the Lord. And it will continue throughout the millennial kingdom. Because again, the day of the Lord is God's direct intervention, either in judgment or blessing. So the day of the Lord begins after the rapture and will continue right to the end of the millennial kingdom. That's the ultimate prophetic day of the Lord. But there certainly are those historical days of the Lord that would be experienced in Judah's calendar and in Judah's history. So let's do a couple of things here now. First of all, let's look at how it, many times it's used in our little book here in the book of Joel. And we've said that it's mentioned in every chapter. So we see it here in verse 15. We see it in chapter two, verse one. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It's close at hand. So again, speaking of something yet to come, it, it, it's, it's not speaking of the plague they've just experienced, but worse is on the way. That's what God is telling them. Again, in chapter 2, verse 11, we read this. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Well, that's kind of strong language. Chapter 3, again, we see, oh, sorry, chapter 2. Two again in verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So again, this is maybe looking at the eschatological day of the Lord that is going to come that we've talked about when God directly intervenes in the affairs of men prophetically. And then in chapter three and verse 42, uh, verse 14 Again, we're looking at Armageddon here. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And again, we see the events that are going to take place. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars sh shall withhold their shining. And so obviously uh, very significant eschatologically this coming day of the Lord. So it's mentioned in each chapter. Now it's also mentioned in other Old Testament books. And we're just going to take a moment to look at the reference. And again, we're, we're going to see the same theme, God directly intervent, intervening in the affairs of men. So let's go back to the book of Isaiah, the prophet, Isaiah chapter 13. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll make some connections between this chapter on more than one occasion as we study this book of Joel, because it really is a very much a parallel passage in many ways. Isaiah 13, verse 6, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Look down in verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to, the, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So, very, very definite God getting involved. And notice verse 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. So God is directly intervening. It's not the day of grace anymore. He's stepping in. He's bringing punishment. The book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 13, Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 5, another reference to this day of the Lord. Prophet Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 5. We read this, it says, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle 
in the day of the Lord. And so again, this reference to the day of the Lord, again, it's going to come against Israel. Uh, they're going to be experiencing divine judgment. The prophet was supposed to stand in the gap and, and others were supposed to stand in the gap. But the day of the Lord is coming. Book of Amos, next one after Joel, right next to Joel, Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Twice we'll see Amos mentions this day of the Lord. And so he says, verse 18, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. So it's going to be a day of darkness, a gloomy day, a day of divine intervention, a day of, of, of swift judgment. Verse 20, Amos 5 verse 20, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? So again, speaking of terrible judgment, over in Obadiah, again, here in the Minor Prophets, we have one another reference to the day of the Lord. Obadiah, and of course, only one chapter, verse 15, where we once more see this. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. And so God is going to visit the heathen with the conduct that they have been involved with. It's going to turn it on their head. They also are going to experience judgment. And then Zephaniah. Interesting how this is kind of a major theme in these minor prophets. But Zephaniah, several references uh, in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests, and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such are clothed with strange apparel. Uh, verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. He shall make even speedy riddance of them that dwell in the land. Again, we see it once more uh, referred to this day of the Lord uh, coming uh, and uh, what a day it is. And it's the day of the Lord's anger, in a sense, his anger against man's rebellion, against sin. And so final book, Malachi in the Old Testament, final reference, Malachi this is the prophetic day of the Lord. This is the one that's not a historical event, but is yet to come. He says this, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so basically, uh, in the broadest sense, the day of the Lord refers to any period in human history when the Lord asserts his rights, and intervenes directly in the affairs of men, either for blessing or judgment. But as we've said, the final expression of the day of the Lord, I'm going to quote from Harry Ironside here, when at last the day of grace is ended, the day of the Lord will succeed it. The day of the Lord follows the rapture. It will be at the time when the judgments of God are poured out upon the earth, it includes the descent of the Lord with all his saints to execute judgment on his foes and to take possession of the kingdom and to reign in righteousness for a thousand years. So wh why would you say the millennium, for instance, is a day of the Lord? Well, because the Lord is ruling with a rod of iron and he's directly intervening in the affairs of men. And any rebellion will be instantly crushed. And so again, it's still divine, direct involvement in the affairs of men, either in judgment or in blessing. So back to our passage in Joel chapter 1, verse 16. It says, Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, 
yea, joy and gladness from the house of God. So Joel continues his description of the distress that they're going through. And again, he talks about the house of the Lord. Here, the poverty of this locust plague was more seriously and keenly felt. They'd gone from years of blessing and abundance, and now they were going through a time of deep poverty, and it was beginning to show its effects in the house of God because the meal offering was cut off from the house of the Lord. What a serious, serious thing it is. When these bugs by the trillions had descended on their land, their joy had withered away as well as their crops. The joy has gone from the land. Yea, joy and gladness from the house of their God. And, and what a terrible situation. It's, it's cut off before their eyes. It's like they're, they're, there's nothing they can do about it. They're literally watching helplessly as their livelihood and even their means of worship disappeared before their very eyes. How terrible to witness such a thing. But that is what they had witnessed, verse, uh, verse 17. And this is the first hint that it, it's more than just a locust plague involved here. Along with the locust plague, it seems to me that there's something bigger going on. There's actually a drought condition as well. And notice the language here. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. And so it seems that as, uh, as we consider this, it's more than a locust invasion the whole tragedy had been compounded by a drought. This ensured that even after the locusts had departed, there was no fresh shoots of grass or grain appearing, and the hope of even the slightest relief was zero. The barns were not only being not used, they were falling into disrepair. He, he talks about the, the barns are broken down, the corn is withered. So this is, this is a very bleak, bleak time. Uh, very uh, drought conditions. Uh, notice verse 18. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. So now the livestock is going through deep distress. Domesticated animals are in starvation. I just actually saw, uh, apparently there's uh, currently a, a tremendous famine in Zimbabwe, and I saw pictures of, of elephants that were just dead and rotting because the water holes have all disappeared. And so literally just seeing their, their bones as they, 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 they perish. And so, and that's going on right now in Zimbabwe. And so, again, we just see this, the stock is distra distressed, they're groaning, they're perplexed. Verse 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry. And I want you to notice that the, the prophet himself now becomes an intercessor. It, it, it's a short prayer. It's it's a it's an what we say an ejaculation. It just comes out from him as he as he considers the conditions. He he has no almost look no choice but to cry out, and so he cries out, "Oh Lord, to Thee will I cry," and and then he talks about why. Of course, it's good, isn't it, to have a prophet who is also a man of prayer. Uh, he, he he prays, he cries out to God. Uh, we're reminded again of Acts chapter 6 about the apostles. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And again, uh, God's best men are men who know something about the closet and they know being in the presence of God, seeking his face. And so here's Joel and he's he can't withhold. He has to pray uh, he becomes an example to the whole community. This is what everybody should be doing. As he looks at the circumstance, he cries out, this is true leadership. Joel, a prophet who not only preaches, but he also prays. They have not, if they have not been able to sense the urgency of his message until now, hearing his cry might just wake them up to realize we are in serious trouble. And so he, he gives this glorious example, crying out. And then he goes on to describe, and this again shows why we think there's more than just the locust plague. 
He says, the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. The flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beast of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up. Now, locusts can't make the rivers of water to dry up. Right? That's not what they, they can, they can strip the earth, but they can't make the rivers of water dry up. That's a drought. And the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And so the picture really is this. Twice we get this reference to the fire uh, devouring. The fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, verse 19. We see it again at the end of verse 20. The fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And so perhaps the idea is this. It's so dry, the sun scorching the earth, everything is so tinder dry that eventually what happens is begins to set on fire. And there's fire raging throughout the land. And it says, the beast of the field, verse 20, cry. Now, this cry is different to what we saw. It's a different word to the word of the groaning in verse 18. How do the, the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed. It's a different word here. And it's a word we're familiar with. It's a word we know from the, the very lovely psalm, Psalm 42. And this is the word that is being used here concerning the beast. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And so this language seems to indicate that even the, the animals, the livestock that have survived to this point, they're panting after water because the drought is so bad it's devoured it's licked up all the vegetation in sight it's made the land like a wasteland now remember this is the land of israel this is the land that is supposed to be flowing with milk and honey this is the land that's meant to be so prosperous that two men uh, had a stave to carry a bunch of grapes this is the land that god had given his people and what what is it like now well it's a barren, barren place. And again, we, we can only draw application and say this, that sadly, many assemblies that are meant to be places of refreshment, uh, places of usefulness and fruitfulness for God, can go through times of real barrenness, where even the ministry is as dry as old sticks, <laughs> where everything just seems to be lacking moisture, and all oh, what we need to restore the moisture of affection and devotion for Christ, of zeal and love, well, maybe we need to call a solemn assembly. <laughs> maybe we need to get before the Lord and say, Lord, only you can turn the tide and cry out to God. Now, we move into chapter 2, a few minutes left. Chapter 2 is an interesting chapter, because there's so many different ways that people have looked at chapter two. Some have seen chapter two as going through the same details as chapter one, speaking of this original locust plague and basically doing it in a much more poetic language. We're going to say why we don't agree with that in a moment, but some people see that. Some people see it as just prophetic, as a, as a military invasion that is set to come on the nation. And, and so uh, it talks about uh, language like uh, men of war and such like. And so some have seen this to be the case. I'm going to suggest to you that what is in view here is this is the Lord is telling them, unless there's repentance, a second locust plague is going to come that is even worse than the one they've just experienced. OK, and we're going to see why we're going to take this view. And of course, we're going to learn that God is the one who actually is going to bring it unless there's repentance. And so what he's saying, it's not going to get better unless there's brokenness amongst God's people. The conditions are going to worsen. That's really the language 
of chapter two. Now, how do we how do we get that? Well, first of all, we get it from the tenses of chapter two. In chapter one, it's clearly talking about things that have passed. Uh, he he's telling the old men to tell the story to different generations. It's something that's already happened. When we come to chapter two, we'll notice the tenses a little bit. Look at verse five. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap? Okay, shall, shall they? So in other words, it's something still to come. Uh, verse seven, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one in on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. Uh, verse nine, they shall run to and fro. In the city, they shall run up upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows. And so it's things that are yet to happen. Not they have, they shall. So this is this is the tense's future here. And then we see uh, another interesting word in verse 12, where it says, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So what the Lord is saying, this is going to come upon you, but here's how to avoid it. Therefore, now, also now, says the Lord. In other words, in Joel's day, in this very day, how do they remedy the situation? Well, now they need to, uh, as it were here, uh, turn to me with all your heart, with genuine repentance and with fasting, with weeping and mourning. And it could possibly be averted if they will do that. And so we get down to verse 18. And then we have again another tense here. Then, in the words, this is going to happen. Another locust plague is coming. But if now they genuinely come in repentance then verse 18 will the lord be jealous for his land and pity his people he will answer say to his people behold i'll send you corn and wine so if there's genuine repentance then there'll be blessing and he promises them uh, that he will restore to them when notice verse 25 and i will restore to you the years and notice the word years here this is not a one-year event I will store to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and so on and so forth. And so this was going to be a multi-year event unless there was repentance. And God is saying, but if you repent, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to restore. And then there's also a, a, another tense here, which has a future bearing. And notice verse 28 it says, and it shall come to pass afterwards. <laughs> so you, so you, you've got something that's prophetic here. That's of course looking for the, the spirit of God and his activity that is coming afterwards. So basically what we're suggesting here is that chapter two is the threat of a second locust invasion. And God is saying, this is what I'm going to bring. Verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. So he's going to bring this unless there is repentance. Lean times are going to become leaner times unless the people of God heed Joel's message and seek the Lord in prayer, in fasting, and ask him to restore to them the years the locusts have eaten and bring blessing. And so we might, by way of application, just say to ourselves, how long are we content to go on with spiritual barrenness? Does it have to get even worse before it gets better? <laughs> or is there a point where we have to come before the Lord and say, Lord, you're the one who can change the scene. We look to you, crying out to God corporately in prayer, seeking him to change the scene for his glory. Amen.